Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Philip Griffiths, and I'd like to welcome you to our third day of the Hodge Theory Conference. First speaker this morning is Nick Shepard Barron, who will speak on periods and moduli of elliptic surfaces one. First talk, first of two talks. Nick, we're ready for you. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction, Philip, and thank you very much to you and the other organizers for the opportunity to be here and to to talk to you. Well, the title of my talk is as advertised, periods and moduli of elliptic surfaces. And I want to talk about the derivative of the period map for these surfaces and to give it and to describe it. So um, I'm going to be talking about Kähler elliptic, Kähler elliptic surfaces with no multiple fibers. So I'll explain the significance of this assumption. And the key is to describe the derivative of the period map in terms of the ramification of the J, of the J invariant. And then the point is that conversely, from this description, it will be, it turns out that the derivative of the period map um, will provide enough information to rec recover equations for the base curve. So the I emphasize that we're from the weight two Hodge structure of the surface and from data associated to the weight two Hodge structure, we're recovering equations for the curve, assuming that is that the geometric genus of the surface is not too small compared to its irregularity. Now, the, I'm, <clears throat> in almost all situations, the irregularity of the surface will be equal to the geometric genus of the curve. So I'm not going to say, pay much any more attention to, to that assumption. It's in, certain, in all reasonable circumstances, that is the case. Um, so the first thing that I want to talk about is, well, what, the next thing I want to talk about is that when we restrict to algebraic elliptic surfaces, the derivative of the period map has more structure than is immediately apparent. It turns out that um, the bundles involved and the homomorphisms between the bundles um, possess multiplication, um, they have a structure, in fact, of they have a linearization under the sheaf of rings, which defines the ramification locus. So this Z here is always the ramification of the J invariant. So there's a question of typography. Curly Z will be Z on the stack, as it were. Um, and along the way, we discover a certain natural orthogonal basis of the primitive part of H11 of the surface. Um, I'll be more precise about that later. Uh, in terms of certain meromorphic two forms of the second kind, um, these two forms of the second kind appear as derivatives of holomorphic two forms, or rather derivatives of the cohomology class of a holomorphic two form. Um, in a very explicit way. And we also prove a generic Torelli theorem for elliptic surfaces, again, with no multiple fiber. And the key, the key to everything is a plumbing construction for curves and then for the morphisms, um, and I'll, I'll explain what kind of morphisms I'm talking about later, a plumbing construction for curves, which goes back to Fay in his book on, um, So this is his book on theta functions on Riemann surfaces. So this is a really magnificent book full of mathematics. Um, so when we, in fact, th this idea of um, making a plumbing construction and then trying to derive formulae from it is also due to Fay. So uh, the formulae that I'm talking about are formulae for the derivatives of period maps. So in Faye's book, he was talking about period matrices of curves, and it turns out that what he does for curves, we can do in a remarkably parallel fashion for surfaces. Um, and the linear algebra involved turns out to be a dis to give a um, description of the period map in terms of tensors of rank one. 
So this is very reminiscent from what happens when you look at curves. Um, you, the, when you look at the derivative of a period matrix of a curve, you see many tensors of rank one from which you can recover the curve. Right. Okay, so here's some definitions. Um, an elliptic surface is a smooth compact, well, I've emphasized complex surface. Well, of course, we're in uh, with complex numbers um, in this conference. With a morphism to a base curve, where you've got the base is some curve, and the general fiber is a curve of genus one. And according to the classification of complex surfaces by Enriquez and Kadara, these are essentially the surfaces of Kadara dimension one. So from the viewpoint of algebraic surfaces, I emphasize algebraic surfaces, I'm an algebraist rather than a Kähler geometer. Um, elliptic surfaces form a locus of very high co-dimension inside the stack or the moduli of all surfaces. So they're very specialized algebraic surfaces. On the other hand, they do dominate the moduli of curves. Um, so there's something going on there as we shall see. So according to Mioka, as an elliptic surface is Kähler if and only if it's first betting number is even. So I want, I want to remain in the Kähler world. Now, <clears throat> algebraic, weight two hard structures of algebraic surfaces, weight, sorry, H2 of, an, of a complex surface has a Hodge structure even without the Kähler condition. But I only want to talk about Kähler surfaces today um, to be quite honest, being an algebraist, I prefer to stick to algebraic surfaces, but that is not natural because if you start with an algebraic elliptic surface, as soon as you deform it, you can expect to get non-algebraic surfaces. <clears throat> okay, so we have some notation. Um, I want to stay away from the letter G for genus. So I have a, a geometric genus, which is H20, and I'll have an irregularity, which is an H10. And usually, as I've said before, the irregularity of the surface will be the geometric genus of the base. So I'm certainly going to assume that this is, this is a completely reasonable assumption. I don't mind making that. And then we have the <clears throat> an important definition that a surface is simple if it has no multiple fibers. So multiple does not mean singular, Multiple, a multiple fiber looks like M times E for a smooth E, for example. So that's what a multiple fiber is. <clears throat> and I'm, I'll call a surface simple if it has no multiple fibers. So according to Kadara, any elliptic surface comes from a simple elliptic surface by so-called logarithmic transforms. Um, I don't want to go into that, but there are two ways of thinking of it. One is that you start with some completely reasonable elliptic, some completely reasonable simple surface. And then by this torture, you construct new and more general elliptic surfaces from it. Or you can go the other way and say, well, you know, if you encounter an elliptic surface in real life, for example, when surfaces of general type, degenerate, you will see elliptic surfaces arise, then you can, you can say, well, this arbitrary elliptic surface comes from a simple one. But when we're looking at questions of periods, we really cannot expect to see anything for general elliptic surfaces. We can only see simple surfaces when you look at period matrices, as explained here. The point is that if you start with a surface which has multiple fibers, there exists a surface which has simple fibers, but the two surfaces have isomorphic weight two Hodge structures, and it is as a result of Schmitz from the early 70s. So I'll summarize this by saying that periods cannot see, mul cannot see multiple fibers, so we'll restrict attention to simple surfaces. Right. Now I am going to make a bigger assumption and that all singular fibers are as simple as possible. And I'll simply refer to this assumption by saying that X is generic without further justification. I'll explain in a minute, well, you'll see in the course of the argument why this assumption comes in. 
And then a surface is Jacobian, or in Kadara's language, it is a basic surface if it has a designated section. So then it's a genuine, genuinely a family of elliptic curves. So it's important, it will be important to distinguish between the phrase elliptic curve from the phrase curve of genus one. <clears throat> so then giving a Jacobian surface, which is, has only the simplest possible singular fibers, giving a Jacobian surface is the same thing as giving a classifying map from the base curve to the stack of elliptic curves or the stack of generalized elliptic curves. Modulo left equivalence, but not modulo right equivalence. So what is this stack, which is basic to everything that's going on? Well, by looking at the Weierstrass equation of an elliptic curve, you see that this moduli stack is this punctured affine plane, modulo the multiplicative group, which acts with these weights, four and six. And this is true over C. <clears throat> Actually, it'd be true, it's it true in, in all characteristics except two and three. <clears throat> and then, so the way you can think of this is as a decorated J line. So the J line is the coarse moduli space. We've got this stack, which definitely has more structure. So I've drawn a picture here, which I find helpful. Um, so it's the J line, but with decoration. So everywhere at the general, almost everywhere it's decorated by this classifying stack of Z mod two, except that sometimes at one point you have B of Z mod four, and at another point you have B of Z mod six. The idea is that every five, every, every decoration is the classifying stack of the automorphism group of the elliptic curve. So that's the, what this, that looks like. And it, so there is the derivation of the description from Weierstrass equations. So here's a picture again. Um, so we have this stack L bar, its geometric quotient is the J line and the degree of the map down to the, to the coarse moduli space is one half because one half is the, or is the degree of the generic fiber which is B of Z mod two. Now it is a feature of this, of what we're doing, that this stack L bar has a non-trivial automorphism group. It's got a GM acting on it. There are two fixed points. So there are two distinguished elliptic curves, if you like, but otherwise I can't distinguish one elliptic curve from another, which is, I mean, I, this was a learning moment for me when I, when I encountered this. Um, but this reflects for me a fundamental fact in algebraic geometry, which is that the construction of a moduli stack is a very reductive act. I don't mean reductive in the sense of algebraic groups or geometric invariant theory. I mean reductive in the sense of ordinary language. You're taking, when you construct this stack L bar, you're taking an elliptic curve with all of its mathematics and replacing that elliptic curve with nothing more than the classifying stack of its automorphism group. So your, your, your stack, this moduli stack is a very, it's very nearly a homogeneous object. And this homogeneity really is a feature of what we're doing. Oh, it really is a feature of life for us. <clears throat> so, but let me just summarize some properties of this stack. So it's a smooth, proper one-dimensional Deline Mumford stack. And it's got line bundles on it, obviously. So the basic line bundle is the bundle of weight one modular forms, which is defined as the conormal bundle, the zero section on the universal curve. So this is the usual definition of the bundle of weight one modular forms. With higher dimensional abelian varieties, you would take the uh, determinant of the conormal bundle. But here we're already, we don't need to take a determinant. We already have rank one. And its degree is 124. Now by the Kadara Spencer map, the cotangent bundle of this elliptic curve is M tends to two times, but you must subtract off the discriminant and the discriminant has weight 12. So the tangent bundle is a weight 10 24 So 
So you have here that the first chain class of this stack has degree five twelfths. And the crucial thing is that five twelfths is a positive number. I mean, there are, the point is that obviously the J line, the geometric quotient has positive churn class. But to say that the stack has positive churn class is a stronger statement. It's one that we very much rely on. And of course, this number five twelfths comes into the geometry of elliptic surfaces. And there's another way of seeing it, which I don't really want to emphasize, I don't find it particularly useful, in fact. Right, so to go back, we're going to look at Jacobian elliptic surfaces now. So I'm just repeating what I've said before, that these, to give a Jacobian elliptic surface is the same thing as to give a classifying morphism to L bar and the relationship between the invariance of the surface and the invariance of the classifying morphism are that 12 times chi of OX, which is C2, which is the number of singular fibers, is one half the degree of the classifying map because you have this the morphism down to the geometric quotient has degree one half. And again, this is modular left equivalents, modular automorphisms of the curve C, but not modular right equivalents. <clears throat> All right, so it follows that given a Jacobian surface, the tangent space to the stack at that point is this vector space here. So it's this, it's this cohomology of this quotient here. So this is equal to um, naught C mod S, yes. Now, naturally, this, this sheaf S, this skyscraper sheaf S is a line bundle on the ramification locus. So it might, see, it might seem a bit ridiculous to talk about something zero dimensional being a line bundle. And on a zero dimensional scheme, saying that you have a line bundle is not saying very much. Um, but it's when we globalize, it's useful to use the language of bundles. So if I take cohomology of this, now I want to mod out by automorphisms of the curve. And mod, I mod out by left equivalence. So I get a sub object, which is that quotient. I get the thing, this thing here, which is the tangent space I'm interested in. Here is the tangent space to the moduli space of curves. And here is some obstruction space, which annoys me. So I'm going to make assumptions, numerical assumptions, which ensure that this obstruction space vanishes. So let's simply write down some invariance. It's easy to see that the degree of Z is this number here. This will recur throughout the talk, this number. It's the tangent space. I'm going to make now. I'm going to make these numerical assumptions. They have various effects. They, in fact, these assumptions will really come into play when we do some projective geometry later on. So we will have to do some projective geometry of curves, and these assumptions here make the projective geometry much easier. Uh, to be quite honest, without these assumptions, I don't know. I would not be able to do the projective geometry that I need to do. So I'm simply going to assume this. So these can be encapsulated as saying that for a given value of Q, the geometric genus H is not too small. Um, and the, these assumptions also ensure that this obstruction space vanishes by reasons of degree, simply because this degree here is then bigger than two Q minus two. So the obstruction space goes away. And then we get that our Jacobian, a locus of Jacobian elliptic surfaces is smooth of the correct dimension and it dominates the moduli space of curves. And here's a global description. Of, so in fact, for the purposes of this talk, I'm really only looking at the local geometry of the stack. Um, but just to reassure you that we are in a down to earth world, I've got here the stack of curves I have an abelian fiber because I'm choosing a line bundle L on C. So L is the pullback of the classifying. So I've got C to L bar, this classifying morphism. And I pull back the bundle of modular forms of weight one to the curve and I get this one. So I've got an abelian fiber there. And then on top, there's a projective fiber. 
So I've got this hyperbolic base, an abelian fiber, and a projective space fiber on top. And here is a, so here is a rather formal picture which encapsulates what we want. In fact, the most important thing we'll be looking at is this map here. I'll be looking at the, the universal ramification locus over the stack of surfaces. So this universal ramification locker sits inside the universal curve. The universal curve is the base of the universal surface and the universal curve pulls back from the moduli space of curves, which is down here. Um, and again, let me, the Z is the universal, the universal ramification divisor. So now we just, so right, let me just remind you of some numerology. Uh, so this, I've already pointed this out to you. So we have this, this is a tautology, that the tangent bundle to the moduli stack we're interested in is a line bundle on this universal ramification divisor. So it's a tautology. It would be true, true for any Hurwitz stack. You see what I'm really, what, I'm, what we're saying is that this stack of surfaces is a Herbert stack because to give a Jacobian elliptic surface is to give a classifying morphism down to L bar. So usually when you talk about Herbert stacks, your base curve is P1. So here we have a, a Herbert stack where the base curve is the stack L bar. So Xi will always be the class of an elliptic fiber. Now, and I'm interested in the primitive cohomology, which is usually defined as the complement, the orthogonal complement of the fiber and the section, but it's sometimes convenient to use the description as xi per modulo xi. Um, and then we have a coincidence that the psi, the dimension of H1, the primitive H11 is the same as the dimension of the moduli stack. So I, I cannot explain this coincidence but given that, that, given that the coincidence occurs, I can exploit it, as you will see. Right, so as usual, we have a Hodge filtration on the H2 primitive. Um, so, uh, and they fit together into vector bundles on the stack and on the period domain and on the period domain mod gamma. I'm being very, very sloppy about the distinction between the period domain and the period domain module it's quotient simply because all really I'm doing is local geometry. So my maps, my period maps might very well be multi-valued. I'm being very, very careless about that. Uh, so in particular, in terms of these filtrations, I have fill two, F2 is H20, F1 modulo F2 is H11 primitive. And then we have a derivative of the period map and I'm looking at this bit. So the infinitesimal period relations say that the tangent bundle to the stack gets mapped to the space of linear maps from H20 to H11 primitive. And tautologically, well, sorry, no, not tautologically, it is a theorem that this period, the derivative is isomorphic to the ordinary contraction homomorphism given between, well, I have, I have an uh, another description of the tangent space to moduli which is H1 of the tangent bundle with logarithmic zeros along the zero section. And then there's a contraction map. And the basic theorem in the subject is that the derivative is isomorphic to this contraction homomorphism. Well, what I want to do is to, I'm going to formulate this local problem as a local Torelli uh, come Schottky problem. The problem is to find other descriptions of this um, derivative, which are not, well, other descriptions not completely tautologically equivalent to the first one. Uh, so for example, there's a local Torelli theorem due to Masahiko Saito uh, from the 80s, the early 80s. The derivative of the period map is injective. And in fact, he, does, he proves this for all simple elliptic surfaces. And obviously it's not true for surfaces with multiple fibers, given the global problems that I mentioned right at the start of the talk. All uh, right, so here's some more notation. Let's assume that I have an elliptic surface, a Jacobian elliptic surface, and it's generic. So this, the singular fibers are all as simple as possible. And this means that the ramification locus 
is contained in the locus which J is finite. So these, this, is, this tells you, if you like, that um, the generic surfaces I'm looking at are the very opposite of modular surfaces. A modular surface is one where J, uh, sorry, a modular surface is one where the ramification locus is entirely contained in the locus with J equals infinity. So I'm looking at the, the generic surfaces are at the other extreme. So fix a point in the ramification locus. We've seen that by our basic Hurwitz stack, Hurwitz stack tautology, that this defines a line in the tangent space, which is S. And I want this curve here. E will be the fiber over A. Um, so this line, well, any defines a, well, by the Gauss-Menin connection, I can differentiate and I'm going to, I'm going to abuse notation slightly. Uh, the line, V, the point defines a line, but I'm going to use the same notation. So the, <clears throat> by the infinitesimal period relations, the Gauss-Menin connection takes H20 into F1. And then if I project onto F1 modulo F0, I get this one here. And then if I had another point in the, in Z, in the, I would get, I could differentiate again and I'd go up one spot. Right, so now we come, I, at the beginning of the talk, I advertised plumbing constructions. And so here we get to what is the point. Um, so this is due to Faye. So let's start by plumbing curves, which is what Faye does. So I suppose I have two curves and I take one point on each curve and I take a local coordinate on the curve at that point. And I fix some real number delta, which is positive but small. And I take a complex disk of this radius and then I want to plumb things together. So, um, and I need to take a neighborhood. So I take a small neighborhood of the point I in the curve CI and delta has to be small so that this neighborhood does not overlap itself. And now I take separately, I take a surface, a, a piece of a surface. So this F is a separate thing. So I've got two curves and one piece of a surface. And the aim is to plumb together su suitable open subsets inside curve cross disk. So I have two curves. I have two copies of, I have two curves cross disks, and I use this F as a plumbing fixture. So here is a picture of what's going on. Now, <clears throat> you may not believe it. I went to a lot of trouble to draw this picture. I hope it's meant, let me try to say what, the, let me describe the information it's meant to convey. So here's my plumbing fixture F. There's a red piece which gets plumbed to the red piece over here. So this red piece over here is inside one curve across the delta. There's a green piece, which is inside the other curve across delta. And I plumb green to green and red to red. And I can do this. But I haven't told you what the formulae are for doing it. The formulae are crucial. So uh, there is a description. Where are the formulae? Here are the formulae. So zi is equal to q and t is equal to q squared minus v squared. That is a squared. Uh, and then I get, so rho i is an isomorphism from a piece of the, a piece of the surface to its image w. So, <clears throat> sorry. So vi sits inside the plumbing fixture. It goes isomorphically onto some wi which sits inside CI cross delta. So all of these things you can be plumbed together. And then I have inverse, the, my inverse plumbings are given by these formulae here. So Q is equal to ZA and V is equal to this square root. And these square roots have a sign, but the quantity, <coughs> sorry, the quantity T minus Q to the minus two is sufficiently small that this square root is, def I can define this square root by the binomial expansion. So the, everything is plumbed together and then you plumb things together and you get a proper, um, you get a two dimensional complex manifold with a proper morphism down to the disc. 
the same disk as before, defined by this function t, same t as before. And the closed fiber has normal crossings and is reduced. And the smooth fiber is uh, of genus GA plus GB. Now, what Faye did was to, he calculated the derivative of the period matrix at zero. Um, so the, this makes sense. So there's no monodromy. Um, so the period matrix, the curve degenerates, but the period, the period matrix does not. And he got this formula here. And you will see that it's a rank one. And it turns, so here's a special case where one of the curves is of genus zero. But then, then this curve of genus zero is a, can be contracted. So this curve has good reduction. This family here has good reduction. And I can still calculate the deriv derivative of the period matrix. And the, the period matrix here is the same as the period matrix here. So here, here is its derivative. It's very beautiful. It's a very powerful technique. Now, I want to spend some time on the following um, bibliographical point, which one normally would not emphasize. That in fact, in his book, it turns out that Faye makes two different plumbing constructions. But the truth is he confuses them. So, and then Akira Yamada pointed this out. Um, but without, Big point I want to emphasize that the, up, the upshot of all of this confusion is happy. There are two constructions, two different constructions, and a powerful, <clears throat> and in each case, there's a powerful formula for the derivative of the period matrix, which we can use. Um, so, so as I said, Faye Fe, in his book on theta functions um, confuses these plumbing constructions. He subsequently published a footnote. Well, there's a footnote in the subsequent paper where he sorts this out. Um, so, every, so the situation is confusing, but happy. It does make terminology slightly difficult. Uh, so here is the other plumbing. And I'll, not the, you, the other plumbing is a, is a, is a sort of tor, is a toric plumbing. And you get a different formula for the period matrix which is still very beautiful and very powerful. However, this is of no use if one of the curves is rational because then the, the derivative of the period matrix is uninteresting, it's zero. Um, and the second th remark I want to make is that I do not see how to use this second plumbing um, to plumb morphisms from curves to stacks. So we can use, we can, and do use the first plumbing, the one for which I drew a picture and wrote down the formulae. How we do it? Right. Because, and we do it because this first plumbing lends itself to plumbing morphisms from curves to a fixed stack as follows. So suppose some M is some stack. For example, it could be the stack L bar, but in other applications, I also want it to be the stack of genus one curves, which is a more complicated object than the stack of elliptic curves. But it doesn't really matter which stack it is. And suppose that these two morphisms are isomorphic in neighborhoods of um, one point on one curve and another point on another curve. So explicitly, this means that there are local coordinates on each point such that the two morphisms are defined by the same function of one variable. So, so then I can define a morphism for my plumbing fixture to the same stack by sending QV to 5Q. And this works so that we can plumb the morphisms together because remember that the, the plumbing fixture was ZA, the plumbing formulae always said that ZA is equal to Q. So I can plumb these things together. You see, if I took the toric plumbing, I couldn't, I would not be able to, well, if I take the toric plumbing, I cannot see how to do something like this. So that's very convenient, but it's too strong. It's not quite the thing we want to do. 
Suppose that our morphisms, our classifying morphisms, are merely isomorphic to first order. So one, each of them is, so for example, each one of them is ramified at that point. Then what we can do is I can take, I go back to my plumbing, my plumbed family of curves and reduce everything modulo t squared. And then I can plumb together this, I can, can, I can plumb together the first order objects to get a first order morphism phi primed to my moduli stack. And here's the example that we're going to be working with where I take the stack of elliptic curves. I have two surfaces, two Jacobian elliptic surfaces um, corresponding to different classifying maps. So in terms of the J, well, I'm, so I'm going to assume, right, I'm assuming that they're isomorphic to first order. So for example, um, in terms of the J invariant, this is the same thing as saying that the values of J invariant, the values of J are the same and the values of J prime are the same. So then I can plumb together to get this um, thing here. Um, and now I'm going to take the sub example. Well, one of the curves is P1 and the, sur the surface XB is as trivial as possible. So now I get this thing here. So what I can do is I can lift this infinitesimal thing. So this again is modulo T squared. I can lift it, and that's an L bar. I can lift it because the obstructions lie in a space which vanishes. I very, my, so that what this means is that I can, I get a, a family of surfaces like this that lifts the given one. So the, the thing is that I, I know something about this family. I know it modulo T squared. It's a genuine family and I know it modulo T squared. Um, so I want to, so I'm very, the, the, my point is this, I'm trying to construct a variation of surfaces where the period matrix does not degenerate. I'm trying to prove results in the interior of the moduli space and in, therefore in the interior of the period space. So if I, if I plumb together surfaces quite generally, I'm going to create a family, I'm going to create families with monodromy on H2. You see, when, if I go back to the curve situation where I plumb together two separate curves, I create a situation with no monodromy. But in general, as I say, with surfaces, I will get monodromy, except in this very special case when the second surface is as trivial as possible. Then I get good reduction because I can contract this second surface. Um, so I need a name for the fiber. So the picture is this. Uh, so these A's are, ignore these A's, there are, some, there are some standardizing cycles, which I want to use for uh, purposes of reinsurance. So, uh, so in fact, what I'll do is I'll delete them in this picture for the moment. They're merely distracting. So then I can contract this and I get a family of good reduction, a family of good reduction. So this is, um, so x bar to delta has good reduction. That's the point. And what we want to do is to compute the derivative of the period matrix. So I do, right, so the, I picked a basis of uh, normalizing cycles, which gives me a normalized basis of uh, a normalized basis of the space of two forms. Um, and now I'm going to calculate, and this is exactly follows Faye's idea. I'm going to calculate um, two forms on my fiber as residues of three forms. So let me go back to this picture. So this 
this family is the family of good reduction. So in some sense, this is the family that we want. But all our calculations will take place over here. And because it works is all I'm trying to say. The same, if I go back to what Faye did for curves, even when he was looking at a family of curves with good reduction, um, he calculated on the singular family and then made the contract and then made the birational contraction. So we're doing the same thing here. We're going to, we're going to calculate on the singular thing and then perform a and then perform a birational contraction. So the upshot is all of it. So here are some three forms and their residue are two forms are residues of three forms. And since blowing up, since blowing down is possible, each of these three forms, when we is divisible by the defining equation of the exceptional divisor. So this geometric statement here translates into the algebraic statement that every three form on X is divisible by the defining equation of the exceptional divisor. So I simply expand out in undetermined coefficients and I notice that there are no W's in here. So there's a TQ, wedge DV, wedge DW, it's a three form, but there are no W's in the coefficients because the bundle, this line bundle omega three is the pullback of a line bundle on the curve because it's a relatively elliptic surface. So there are no W's there. And now, so here is my two form, it's a residue of the three form and you simply calculate. You calculate and it's completely naive. So this was, um, so G is now the pullback of the plumbing fixture to the threefold. G equals the inverse image of the plumbing fixture in the threefold. Um, I simply calculate, and this is what comes out, that you get your holomorphic differential, holomorphic differential, and you get its derivative, at least locally. And you notice that this derivative only has poles of order two. So here is the, th this is the formula, here from which everything follows. I simply, it's a two form with double zeros, double poles, sorry, along EA. So this quotient space here is of dimension two. So these eaters sort of are, live in a two dimensional vector space and modulo the space of polymorphic two forms, they live in a two dimensional vector space, but their residues vanish. So this imposes a further condition um, and their residues must vanish because they define the class in, well actually in, in the, uh, in Xi per, there's a slight, so I'm being slightly abusive here, but there's one more condition. So the conclusion is, so that all of these eaters are linearly dependent. So, but if I go back to this formula here, as I say, the key point is that the derivative appears as a meromorphic differential with second order poles. And that's the fact that you have a second order poles follows from the very particular nature of the plumbing. Or rather, it follows from the fact that I have very particular knowledge of the plumbing modulo T squared. If I had a more general plumbing, you'd have poles of higher order you'd have poles of higher order here, and you would lose control of the situation. So what this tells us is that we have proved uh, three parts of the following theorem. So here's my notation again. So A is a ramification point regarded as a line in the tangent space. Oh, let me emphasize, say explicitly at this point, I assumed that my ramification divisor lay away from the locus with J is equal to infinity. If, if this point A corresponds to a singular elliptic curve, 
then I do not know how to make the plumbing construction. And moreover, these differentials, these cohomology classes would degenerate. So I, from both before the fact and after the fact, I have to ensure that my points in the ramification divisor stay away from the locus where j is equal to infinity. So then we have this uh, gauss mini derivative and it is of rank one. And its kernel is exactly the space of two forms that vanish along the fiber EA. So why is that? Well, look, I mean, <clears throat> Um, it follows from the fact that the leading coefficient of the leading coefficient of this is the same thing as the leading coefficient of eta. So as I said, when I expand out eta j, the leading coefficient, the coefficient of zA to the minus two is this thing here. Um, I'm abusing notation slightly. When I write omega j, I should mean omega j divided by dq wedge dw. Right. But back to our theorem. So we have this, the derivative is a, is a rank one. We know the kernel. It's the space of two forms that vanish where you think they vanish. And its image is the line generated by a particular vector. So it's a cohomology class generated by a meromorphic two form with no residues, a meromorphic two form of the second kind. I mean, it has to be of the second kind. I'm saying that it's of the second kind merely means that it defines a global cohomology class. But its residues are van residues vanish. Oh, here we are, such that the residue is zero. And by local Torelli, these vectors, these cohomology classes are non-zero. So we've proved all of that. So we have this. So moving on, and we have this useful fact that if I look at two different points in the ramification divisor. And if I look at the two different eaters, and if I differentiate one eater against the other point, I remain in the first part of the filtration. A priori, you jump up into the zeroth part, but in this instance, you don't. In fact, this derivative is a linear combination of the two things that are, st that are staring in front of you. And the proof is that um, we use the same construction. I mean, let me just say, what am I? I'm, I'm making a statement here about second derivatives. My plumbing family, I only know to, fir to first order. I only know it modulo t squared. So I cannot, <coughs> a priori, I cannot expect to use that family to calculate a second derivative. So what we do is we use the same first order family and then just plug in the forms eta that we've got. And then what you find is that the same calculation. So I write, I write the eta as the residue of a free form with appropriate poles. And then you just repeat the same, you just repeat the calculation. Um, you repeat the calculation and you get this result. So from this, we can deduce that these classes are orthogonal and they're non-zero, so they're linearly independent. And the proof of orthogonality is entirely stupid. Um, you just differentiate. If I take a look, if I differentiate this equation, then covariance gives me that. But this one here vanishes because here I have something in F2, here I have something in F1. So those two paired together are certainly zero. And I'm left that this is equal to zero, which is exactly what we wanted. So you've got all these cohomology classes and you've got, and they're orthogonal, to, to, sorry. You've got these orthogonal, these cohomology classes, they're non-zero and they're orthogonal. Now we can start exploiting what was merely a coincidence. So we have to, this course, the fact that um, 
the dimension of the moduli stack is equal to the dimension of the primitive cohomology group, which is this number n. So it follows, since all of these classes are orthogonal, that they form an orthogonal basis of H11 primitive. And then you can say that this vector bundle H11 primitive is naturally a line bundle on this ramification device, the universal ramification divisor. In other words, what I'm saying is that as a, as a sheaf on the stack JE, this sheaf H11, H11 primitive, has multiplication by the functions on Z. And since the ranks involved are the same, that my vector, my vector bundle on JE becomes a line bundle on Z. And you simply have to multiply sections. I got to, rather, I have to tell you how to multiply sections. Well, I've got this standard basis and I simply multiply basis element by function component wise. And so this is a very lengthy answer. Uh, do it component wise is really. Do it component wise. That's what I'm saying here. That's all this bump is about there. Right, so now, um, I can do something to define this map. So let me just recall for your convenience, this basic map here. And this is the thing we're really interested in. And we have a period map, a derivative of the period map, which is this. Now we've already observed from the Hurwitz tautology that this tangent bundle is a line bundle on, on Z. So S, remember, is a line bundle on Z. Um, and we've just proved that this is a line bundle on Z. This is not a line bundle on Z. It's got the wrong rank. But let me remember that the, the bundle of relative two forms on X is the pullback of a line bundle from the curve. So P is a line bundle on the curve. P is here. I can pull that, I can restrict that to Z. Z sits inside C. Um, so, and there's an evaluation map. So what this tells us is that the period map here, <clears throat> fact, so if I go back to part two of the theorem, sorry, let me, you know, no, this is very helpful scrolling back like this, but from this formula here, from the actual, not just from the statement of the theorem, but from the actual formula, so I'm giving the wrong reference. It's really from this formula here. That what I conclude, what I conclude is I scroll and I scroll and I scroll. I conclude that my, the derivative of the period map factors like this. Well, this vertical map is the evaluation map. So in other words, the derivative of my period map, which was a priori homomorphism of vector bundles on JE, uh, arises as a homomorphism of line bundles on Z. Or if you like, the period map does involve, um, does have a linearization by Z. So, um, since the, the period since the period map is injective on fibers, which is local to Rayleigh, this linearized map here. So what this is, I'm saying is, so this, I'm saying this is a solution to the local to Rayleigh problem. My period map, the derivative of the period map has an O of Z linearization. And as such, it's expressed in terms of an isomorphism of line bundles. So what's going on here if I compare this to the moduli space of, of curves, I'm, I'm, our, our stack of surfaces dominates the stack of curves. But what we're seeing when we look at the derivative of the period map is some structure that does not appear when we look at curves. And we have, we have further linearization involved. 
we have, there is further structure. These homomorphisms are acted on by some sheaf of rings on the moduli stack. At least when we restrict attention, I should say, rather, when we restrict attention to a suitable open piece of the substack. So I have to restrict attention to the locus over which this ramification divisor is et al. That is to say, over which the sheaf of rings is a sheaf of semi-simple rings. So then we have a solution on, we have a solution on this generic locus, um, but I don't know how to extend this linearization. I mean, the questions about extending this linearization, um, the questions about gluing these, if I have a sheaf of rings, I've got a sheaf of little rings, is the one big ring which unifies all the little rings? Um, I'm trying to ask this question without saying um, Frobenius ring, but that's what I'm asking for. If there's some kind of Frobenius ring which governs everything that's going on, and I don't know where that Frobenius, I, I shouldn't say anything because I, I don't know, I don't know how to attach meaning to the words I'm saying, so I should stop saying them. Sure. Right, so let me move on. Um, so I'm going to, let me talk, let me just say one last thing, and then I'll stop. I've tried your patience for long enough, I think. So finally, we can recover the curve and Z and the ramification divisor from the derivative of the period map by elementary linear algebra. So this is, so the image of the period map is a subspace of a space of matrices and it's got a particular basis where the eaters form a basis of the big vector space and the omegas, well, the omegas live in the small, the small space, but there are many more omegas in the dimension of the space. And omega, the kernel of this linear map is the set of two forms vanishing on the curve EI. So I is here a point in Z. Now, Okay, lemma bang. I, well, originally this lemma was much harder, um, but it became simpler when I proved better theorems. Um, every rank one tensor in this n-dimensional vector space is a multiple of one of these. Well, proof extremely obvious, but very useful. So what is, how do we use this? Well, we have my surface X and it has, it maps down to this curve C and the curve is the canonical model of X. The, the curve is embedded by the complete linear system KX, which is the same thing as this linear system on the curve. And by this lemma, the subspace, the, so the image of the period, so V remember is the image of the period map, the image of the derivative of the period map. Um, so what does tell, so from this lemma, the image of the derivative of the period map de determines this set Z as a finite subset of projective space. So I have a, at this point, we know Z, we don't know what C is. So C is an unknown. C is unknown, um, but we, know, we do know something about it. We know two things about it, it's linearly normal, and its degree is sufficiently large because we assume that to be the case. So by a theorem of Mumford and saint uh, from about 50 years ago, these two hypotheses imply that the curve is an intersectional quadrix, obviously not a complete intersectional quadrix, merely an intersectional quadrix. Um, in fact, the ideal is generated by quadrix, but we don't need that strength. We just need to know that the curve is an intersectional quadrix. Moreover, I'm assuming this thing here. So the degree of Z is greater than twice the degree of C. So we can conclude the quadrix through Z must contain C. So therefore the derivative of the period map determines first of all Z and then via quadratic interpolation, it recovers the curve. Um, but, 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 you see, you'd like to say, aha, surely we've solved the Torelli problem at this point. 
but we haven't because of this annoying group of automorphisms of the stack, which is there. So at best, at best, if you know C and Z, the best you can do is to, to determine the classifying morphism up to right equivalence. And remember, the classifying morphism determines the surface. So I cannot determine the surface because of this annoying group of automorphisms. But what I can prove, it's not surprising at this point, that generically, this, the data of C and Z are enough to recover V and Z and X modulo the group of automorphisms. I cannot do better than that. And the proof is a hack, frankly. Um, once um, you know you've got to prove it, you can prove it, you do prove it. And honestly, there are no surprises. It's just a bit of a mess because you're trying to do projective geometry in a slightly stacky world and um, I don't, I mean, it's just, the, there are various cases to be considered because on the stack, different points of different automorphism groups, you can imagine that the details are a little bit tiresome. Um, so what I think I'll do is I'll stop there and just warn you that I have more things to talk about um, tomorrow. Thank you, Nick, for uh, a really very nice talk and the Oh, floor is open for any comments or questions. Yes, one question that actually I saw it might be turning up in the last item on your next talk uh, is this for algebraic surfaces, there is the uh, issue of the derivative of the period mapping at a surface that has the wall singularity. So that's the one quarter, one comma one yes. uh, singularity with no monodromy. Right. So for a family over the disc, which is smooth away from the origin, wall surface at the origin, uh, there's well-defined Hodge structure at the origin. Yep. What is the derivative of the period map at that ball surface? Nobody. I do not know. Yes, I, I do not know. I mean, in general, because I do not know how to construct, how to make these plumbing constructions in the context of more general algebraic surfaces. It's more that um, when I talk about algebraic, I was going to planning anyway to say something about algebraic surfaces, some algebraic surfaces of general type. I mean, as you know very well, the moduli of algebraic surfaces of general type is even when the invariants are small, is extremely complex, very rich yeah. and complex. Yeah. Um, I was really, I only had, I was proposing to make some remarks about examples and I had nothing, I know nothing about that particular example that you've raised. I mean, the underlying geometric question there is uh, the question, even a conjecture, that the surfaces with the wall singularity form an irreducible smooth divisor in moduli for these I surfaces. Yeah. So the so, question or statement, sorry. But, um, can you repeat the question, Phil? Yeah. Whether the surfaces I surfaces with mm -hmm. a wall singularity form a smooth divisor in moduli. Oh, I hear the question. No, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, what I, the, and the situation with these I surfaces, as, as I understand it, and as I see it, is that the, 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 there are many, many boundary components. You can sit down and sort of find a new one before lunch most days. It's very, very complicated. Um, and the, what I was going to talk about was the fact that for most surfaces of general, general type, there are very few variations of rank one. There are very few variations where the period map has, where the yeah. derivative of the period map is yeah. rank one. So you can, but on the other hand, when the surface degenerates without monodromy, 
then you on the singular surface you do see rank one variations. Okay. So, so the, the singular some it's often the case that singular surfaces have um, that the derivative of the period map for singular surfaces has a very different structure from the derivative map the derivative map for smooth surfaces simply because there are lots more many more tensors of low rank of rank one. Yep. Um, that's all I, that's the only real remark I was going to make about those surfaces, uh, merely via pointing out examples. Great, thank you. Any further questions, comments? So, may, may I have a question? Please. Please. Yes, um, so, um, um, for, for, for the elliptic surface of clear dimension one, and without uh, multiple uh, mo multiple single fiber, and I think uh, the V two uh, Tauhani map is not ours in JQ, right? You need um, some uh, additional condition. Right? For, but the, for the ones I'm considering, where the J invariant is non-constant, I uh -huh. am all right. I'm certainly. My assumptions have taken me away from those difficult situations that you're talking about. Uh -huh. the, the, anyway, there should be some uh, sort of uh, elliptic surface of Kodai dimension one yes. uh, without uh, a multiple single fiber, yes. but uh, the V2 PRS map is not injective, right? Yes, you're right. To, to right? There, but, but, Yes. You, you should have this kind of example, right? Sorry? You should yes, have this kind of example. Right, but they will not, I'm, I'm saying that they will not occur under the assumptions that I've made. I'm uh -huh. assuming that the geometric genus is sufficiently large compared to the irregularity. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And I'm assuming uh -huh. that the, the J invariant is non-constant. Mm -hmm. And I'm also making assumptions on the nature that the singular fibers are generic. Okay, okay, mm -hmm. okay, thank you. No, no, okay, no. thank you. Okay, but uh, maybe uh, I, I should mention recently I wrote a paper, joint paper with uh, Lu Xing and uh, Sun about uh, the fundamental group of the modular space of elliptic surface of Kodai dimension one, mm -hmm. but without uh, multiple singular fibers. Right. It shows that the fundamental group uh, is infinite. And the new Arbinium. Okay. In fact, uh, we use two sort of uh, period mapping. Assume, assuming the V two, uh, uh, V two period mapping is in JQ. Certainly, okay. you get you get uh, the, the the big fundamental group, right? But if this V two period mapping is trivial, then we try to show the the base of this uh, of this elliptic fibration together with the degeneration locus of this uh, elliptic curve does not jump. This means that if you move the elliptic surface in the modular space, then the base curve of this elliptic fi fibration together with the degeneration also move in some modular space. Of the pair as pair of, of curve with with the points mm -hmm. and effectively. So therefore you can use sort of weak one where you know variation of hot structure attached to this base curve uh, together with, with this uh, degeneration point. In this way, we still get uh, sort of Tohani map, but not very not very directly. So what was the last thing that you said? I could not hear you. Um, uh, if the V2 Tohani map is trivial, okay, yeah. on this assumption, we show that the, the, the base curve of elliptic fibration uh, with, uh, with degeneration locus does not jump in the, in the modular space of elliptic curve, uh, elliptic surface. 
When you say does not jump, you mean it varies continuously? I mean, and just mean that the, 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 the number of the points does not, uh, does not jump. The number oh, okay. of the generation points does not jump. Um, I'm okay. I'm, I must say this that means the, that if you move, move your elliptic surface in the, in, in the family, yeah. then you can also move the base curve of this elliptic fibration together with the degeneration locus smoothly. Okay. You get, you, you get a new family, an associate family of, of curves, of algebraic curves together with the marked points. Right. And uh, and we show that if the elliptic surface move effectively, max, for example, with the maximal variation, then we can also show the base curve together with degeneration locus of the singular fibers okay. also move maxima with okay. the maximal variation. Okay. In this way, you get a weak one variation of a hard structure. Right. Not directly, uh, it's, it's not directly from the elliptic surface, but from the, from, from the base curve of the, the elliptic fibration. Together with, with, with this degeneration locus. Okay. I'm so called a log, log uh, variation of log, log, log structure. A log, yeah, a log variation of a log, 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 log hard structure. Okay, I'm so I, maybe I'm, we should. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but it might be that we should continue this um, uh, sort of offline. Yes, because yes. We are okay. a bit over. <laughs> and um, I guess I'd like to thank again Nick for uh, for a lovely talk. And since we did start late, I think we'll start the next talk in ten minutes. That's at. Uh, 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 10.45 Eastern time, uh, just 10 minutes from now, we'll begin the next talk.